Hey everyone, thank you for joining us online here at Destiny. If you haven't had a chance to visit our campus, we would love for you to come out and join us for our 1030 service. But if you can't, you can always watch us online at destinyokc.com. And while you're there, you can watch any of our past messages, see any of our upcoming events, or read pastor's vlogs. Also, don't forget to follow us on all of our social media platforms right here. And now, here's this week's message. Well, good morning. Happy New Year. Why don't you just take a moment and just thank our worship team, would you? Don't they do a great job? Thank you, Lord. Would you mind going? Yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. We're just going to dive in. How about we do that? Does that sound like a good thing to do? Uh, on, thank you, dude. I'm honored to be able to preach this morning and to teach and... Pastor Lawrence, I know, wishes he could be here, but uh, him and Tracy just partied too hard last night and are hungover <laughs> at home. <laughs> okay. I just thought of that. I probably should not do that. But they're on their anniversary trip, so <laughs> that's where they are. <laughs> He's going to kill me. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, what a wonderful time. If you have your Bibles, why don't you grab them and go to Matthew chapter 28, and then we're going to read in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Matthew chapter 28, and then Ephesians chapter 4. And as you're turning there, our uh, word for the year for 2023 is deeper. We want to go deeper. Yeah. And uh, I want to just talk to you this morning about maybe some uh, things we can do to go deeper. What are some practices that we can do? Trying to be, a, trying to be practical, um, but also, um, uh, I don't, in these moments, I'm concerned sometimes that preachers overpromise. If you just do this, 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 you'll get that. And my experience is not that, that's not always the case. So what I want to do is give you some historically grounded practices that the church has engaged in when they wanted to be transformed by Christ. That makes sense? So we'll do that. All right, Matthew chapter 28. We're going to start at verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Everybody say, make disciples. There you go. Of all nations, baptizing. Everybody say baptizing. baptizing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Spirit. Teaching them. Everybody say teaching. Teaching. Teaching them to observe, or the old KG would say obey. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now we're going to read a passage from Ephesians 4. This is the Apostle Paul. We're going to begin at verse 19. Ephesians 4 and 19. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Would everybody say learned Christ? Learned. Assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off the old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Notice that. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on a new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and true holiness. Let's pray. Father, we just pray the next few moments that you would help us go deep, that you would meet with us deep unto deep. Uh, Lord, we are bombarded uh, from all sides of our lives, it seems like, with the opinions of men, so would you keep this time from that? Lord, I, I pray that you would, um, I just pray for our children right now, that you would bless them, that you would give them a heart to know you and to walk in your ways that they would see your beauty and desire to follow you all the days of their life. And would you bless those who are ministering to them right now. And here, Lord, I pray, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. And I'm going to need a lot of help. But I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was up thinking about this morning and, and how to kind of frame it, I, I recalled a, a memory of being in college and uh, having, we had this little Bible study with the, uh, um, with a bunch of students, really men, uh, who were in Greek class, and we would read the Bible together, and we came to, we were reading through 1 John, and we came to 1 John chapter 3, and if you're not familiar with it, verse 19, there's a passage that says that uh, no one born of God commits sin, for God, uh, God's nature abides in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God, and we all kind of just stared at each other like, uh-oh, what does this mean? Until one of the kids who was a Greek, you know, in the Greek class with us saved everybody by saying, well, the Greek verb there is an indicative, so it means he who continues 
continually sins. That's what it means. Now, just so you know, this is how I think. When he said that, everybody felt relief. I didn't. Everybody went, oh, whew, continually sin. I'm like, wait a minute. Does that mean like I can kill someone every 10 years? I just can't do it every year? Does it mean I can, I can commit sin on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just not Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday? What does continuous mean? Where's that line? And I had a, mo- I had a realization in that moment with those guys. And I don't know if I've ever solved this in my life as much as I want to just talk to you today about it and, and basically work out my own thoughts. So this is just really therapy for me, so I'm glad you're here. <laughs> but here was a thought. This was a thought. If I told those guys in that, t- in that group, I, want to, I have decided I am going to quit sinning. I have decided I'm going to obey Jesus and I'm going to follow him with everything that I have and I'm going to stop sinning. They would look at me and say, you were foolish on the border of perfectionism. Don't you know that's heresy? But if, then if I were to look at him and say, all right, guys, I've decided I will never quit sinning, and I've decided I'm not really interested in obeying Jesus, they would look at me and say, I'm not sure you're saved. Now, you know what you call that? You call that neurotic, clinical definition of neurotic. I can't stop it because that's wrong, but I can't even say that I, all right, then I don't want to stop it. That's wrong. I realized that I was a part of a community of people where I could not intend on following Jesus and that was okay as long as I just didn't say it. That that felt odd to me. Does that feel odd to anybody else? Maybe I'm the only one. Again, I guess this is my, my therapy session, right? So let me ask you just a very serious question. What do you do when Jesus... Um, Oh, we'll look at it a moment. In Matthew 28, when it says we're going to make disciples and we're going to teach them to obey. If somebody was to come to you today and say, hey, I am really serious about going deeper with Jesus. I'm all in. What do I do? What would you tell them to do? How do we help? What do we do? And I want to talk about some of that. So Matthew 28 tells us that we're to make disciples. And how are we to make disciples? Well, the first thing it says to do, we are to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism is, is, a, is a practice that we do as a church where we physically baptize people in water. In fact, uh, put it on your calendars, January 15. In a couple weeks, we're going to be baptizing people on Sunday morning. If you're here and you're interested in being baptized, there's a card in the seat back in front of you, a connect card. You can put your name on it, fill it out. Tell us that you want to talk to us about baptism. Put it in the giving station and somebody will contact you and we will walk you through how to do that. But baptism, we we submerge people in water, but that's not actually what Jesus, Jesus is not saying, hey, go make disciples by taking people and throwing their head underwater and just saying a few words, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, bam, ha ha. Now you have to be a disciple. No, he means submerge them in the reality of the Trinity. Submerge them in the love of the Father. Submerge them into the accomplishments of his son. Submerge them into the realization of there's this presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Now we show that in a symbol of baptism. But a disciple is somebody learning how to live their life submerged in the Trinity. But then the next part that we often forget, right? It's the great omission of the great commission. Teach them to obey. Teach them to obey. In other words, the good news is obedience is something that can be learned. It's something that can be learned. And like learning anything, you have to start out by assuming you don't know. Right? It's, and, and, and when Jesus says, teach them to obey or teach them to observe my commands, teach them to do something that's very action-oriented. And, and when you have an action and you're trying to teach someone an action, it's very, we, we don't like to make it simple sometimes. We make it harder than it is. But I, you teach someone to ride a bike... Not when they know they should ride a bike. You've taught someone to ride a bike not when they think they could ride a bike. You haven't taught someone to ride a bike when they feel guilty for not riding the bike. You teach them to ride a bike when they can get on the bike and ride it on an appropriate basis. Teach them to obey doesn't mean to teach them to feel like they should obey. It doesn't mean teach them to feel bad about not obeying. Teach them how to do it. Or like we read in Ephesians, may you learn Christ. That's not the way you've learned Christ. In other words, it's implied they learned Christ. So what does it mean to learn or to obey? 
In other words, what we need is an appropriate way that if we practiced, if we would engage in certain things, we would grow in our ability to discern and follow Jesus. We often think of obedience, don't we, like it's just a choice. Like in a moment of crisis, when I'm tempted or something happens, that's the moment i got to choose to obey. But going through life that way is like saying, it's like saying I want to have the home run record of Babe Ruth, but the only time I'm going to swing a bat is when I'm in the game. You see, refusing to practice away from moments of crisis and temptation to arrange our lives in a certain way where we're learning how to stay at home with the Father continually helps us then when we enter into moments of crisis. But if you think of obedience as like only, only that moment when you're in crisis, now i got to make the right choice, then you're missing it and you'll find obedience to be a heavy, heavy yoke, not one that is easy and light. In other words, listen, we often say we're going to follow Jesus, but we go about doing it by, by not doing anything he did. Have you noticed that? Everybody all right so far? Where else do you do that in life? Where else do you go? I want to get the same results that guy did. Well, how are you going to do it? I'm going to do it by doing nothing that he did. (laughs) Where do you do that? When you realize something, Jesus arranged his life, and he practiced certain things intentionally that enabled him to stay at home with the Father and obey. And what if we took seriously arranging our lives the way Jesus did? Now, before you think I'm talking about sandals and all kinds of things, I mean the the practices that we see emerge in his life. Learning to obey means just that, that we must choose an overall, realizing Jesus chose an overall way for his life, and we should too. And that's not opposed to grace. People think, well, if I do that, then it's works. No, it's not. Listen, grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Earnings an attitude. Effort is an action. You can have effort and not have earning go with it. We can do some stuff that's not works, that places us in a position to better receive God's grace. Now, I'm not saying that learning to obey is easy. I am not saying that we will ever be perfect in it. I'm only saying that we can learn to do it better. And if we're going to talk about going deeper, what would it look like to have a year in which we intend to learn to obey. We intend to adjust our lives in an overall way like Jesus did and just see what might happen. How might he meet us? How might he transform us? At the end of the day, we are always transformed by grace, not by our efforts. But, these, but learning how to arrange our lives in a way just means there's places we can go to meet Jesus and receive more of his grace. That's what we're saying. So I want to give you some. I want to give you some practices and just kind of frame what might be needed. If we are going to learn to obey, what are some things that we need to start out with? Here are three things you need to start out with. Number one is we have to consider the vision that we have. You have to have a clear vision of what it means to, be, to follow Jesus. We have to have a clear vision of what it might look like. And, and what, uh, in a way that does not, for example, limit our humanity. Oftentimes people don't intend on following Jesus because we're afraid if we follow Jesus, he'll make us into something we don't want to be. Like if I follow Jesus, he'll make me all prudish. If I follow Jesus, I can't have any fun. If I follow Jesus, I'll just be so holy and tight I squeak. You know? You ever meet those people? I met people that just look like they got weaned on a pickle. They just, but they love Jesus, you know? Look, we have to have a clear vision. What Jesus wants for you is to teach you how to be fully alive as God intended for human beings to be alive. And to be alive in God's kingdom. Now, that's also in a world that's fallen. That doesn't make it easy. But we have to think about what's the cost of non-discipleship? What does it cost you to not follow him? Proverbs said the way of the transgressor is hard, not the way of Jesus. What if we think about what it costs us to not do it? Because there's a loss of opportunity cost if we decide to not follow Jesus. And we have to evaluate what that is. So we have to have a clear vision on why we want to do this, how we're going to follow it, how it might be good for us, how it might make our lives more deeper and meaningful and more joyful to follow Jesus. Not necessarily easy. But then not only do you have to have a clear vision, you actually have to intend to do it. You have to use your volition, your will. Now listen, you will never change and you'll never learn obedience by will alone, but you'll never change if your will's not involved. 
We have to make some decisions. I got to decide that I'm going to, um, to try to follow Jesus or, or at least get better in areas of my life, right? We have to intend to do it. Now listen, you can't, for, your will is really limited and we don't think about it much, but you can't just choose to be skinny. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice, right? Skinny, boom. You all right? You cannot choose to be skinny. You cannot choose to run fast. You cannot choose to bench press 300 pounds. You cannot choose to just play the piano. What you can choose to do is engage in practices over periods of time and which might make you skinny. Or you can engage in lifting weights over a period of time and which you might be able to bench press 300 pounds. You'll be able to do after practice what you could not do by will. You might be able to sit down and as the keys of that piano almost fight you and you keep practicing and you keep giving diligent time, you can then begin to integrate that practice into your body in which you can play the piano as if naturally, as if you're not thinking much about it. That's possible. That's what training is. And we have to move as Christians from stop trying to be like Jesus to start training to be like Jesus. I'm not trying to do it. I'm trying to, I'm, tr- I'm trying, I'm training by engaging in these certain practices that he will meet me and he will form me. I have to have the long view in mind, not a short view. Yes. So, yeah, I'll drink to that. Um, <laughs> we can decide that that is what we're going to train to do and over time we might, at the end of the day, even if you don't hit the bullseye, you got closer. Right? But then if you have a vision and then you have intention, you have to find the means. You have to find means. That is activities that if we engage in a regular basis will enable us to do what we cannot do in the moment of uh, our will alone. Right? With proper means, we can stop trying and train. We can push away the shame and guilt that often accompany not being able to obey Jesus. And we can set all the shame and guilt aside because he knows I can't obey him. That's why he told me I got to learn. There's a great passage in John I just love. It's like, um, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? Now, you could hear that as if Jesus is saying, nan, nan, boo, boo, if you love me, right? Like, I'm going to take my toys home. He's not saying it that way. He's saying, look, if you'll concentrate on loving me, you will keep my commandments. I'll make sure it happens, right? So listen, if you love me, yeah, if you focus on loving me, you will keep my commandments. And then the next verse, I love it. And I will send to you a helper. In other words, like, boy, you're going to need some help. Like, I'm going to help you because you're going to need a bunch of it. He knows that. Like, we just need to just relax a bit. Because what ends up happening is we end up thinking if we're not perfect, then there's no, no reason at all. And what I'm saying, there's miles in between that. Miles. Going too far is not our prevailing problem. So we have to find the means by which if we engaged in, it would transform us. Take learning a language, for example. Let's say I want to learn Chinese. I have to have a vision on why that might be good and right. I could say, well, they're going to like own most of the world one day, so I might as well learn some Chinese, right, whatever. You have to have some sort of vision, though, why that's a good thing. Then I got to intend to learn Chinese. I decided I'm going to learn Chinese, but then I got to have means. What would you say to me if I said, hey, guess what? I'm going to learn Chinese. I've decided it. This is why, you know, they're going to own most of the world one day. So I'm just joking by that, but I'm just saying, you know, maybe that's a motivation for some people. And I, I want to learn Chinese. And then you ask me, well, then how are you going to do it? And I was like, I don't have a way. It's just going to happen to me. And you say, do what? You know, like, are you going to use your CD? Are you going to go take classes? Nope. I'm just going to happen. It's just going to happen. I'm going to sit here and meditate, and I'm going to speak Chinese. It's just going to happen. What would you say? You would say, one, I probably have already decided to not learn Chinese. My point is, you can have a vision of what it looks like to be Christ-like. You can intend on being Christ-like. But to not have any means is to go ahead and decide not to do it. What I'm trying to tell us, and hopefully will convey to you in the next brief moments, is that the church history, Jesus' life and church history is full of means, of practices that have been proven throughout history to help us grow deeper with Jesus. So I want to give you a couple. I want to give you some that are um, practices of engagement and then pra- our practices of abstinence first and then practices of engagement. These means, that we are, these means by which we are transformed, the church is classically called spiritual disciplines or spiritual practices. Now, I just need to be very clear. These spiritual practices that I'm about to give you are not acts of righteousness. Please hear that. That means that by doing them doesn't make you more righteous. 
There's a really great argument that if you were righteous enough, you wouldn't need to do them. They're not acts of righteousness. They don't make you more holy. They're acts of wisdom and that they're practical ways. I meet Jesus and am formed by him. But practicing them does not make you better. In fact, you'll see the more you end up practicing them, you, the more you realize <laughs> how far you have to go. Right? So I want to give you a couple practices, but not just tell you this is what they did. I want to try to give you the heart behind it, like, like the spirit of it. Why is this good and lovely for us? How can it help us go deeper? So, um, again, it, we often desire to have an inward life of vitality and relationship with God that Jesus did. We don't practice the things that he did. So I want to try to help us do that. So the first thing, practices of abstinence, I'm going to give you two here. Um, just a reminder, First Peter 2 reminds us to abstain from fleshly lusts that war against our soul. What I mean by abstinence is this. Uh, practice of abstinence is when we uh, uh, abstain to some degree or for some time. Everybody hear that? Some degree, some time from the satisfaction of what we generally would call legitimate desires, such as food, sleep, bodily activity, companionship, sex, or things like comfort, convenience, material security, or reputation, or fame. There's a whole bunch of things we could abstain from, right? But what I want you to keep in mind as we begin to talk about these is when I say we are to our practices of abstinence, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with these desires. Do you hear me? It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with these desires. It means oftentimes these desires can become disordered in our lives in such a way that they almost become hosts of sin in our personality. Desires can become, they can be good, but when you make a good thing an ultimate thing, it's idolatry. So they're good desires, but they can become disordered in a way that actually functions as a host for sin in our personalities. And we want to get to that, not just talk about the sin, but get to what's hosting it, right? But these desires, again, uh, get distorted. So one of the common results of these practices is they bring these desires back into their proper place in the economy of God and if we can subordinate these desires to the will of God, then they, when they are opposed to our souls, we might find our souls flourish. Does that make sense? All right, let's talk about the first one. Everybody all right? Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm having fun. <laughs> the first one is solitude. Solitude. You see, Jesus practiced this often by going into the wilderness, by going off at night to pray by himself. Solitude. Jesus assumed we would practice it when he says in Matthew uh, uh, 5 through 6 that we should go into the secret place. That's solitude. Now, what is solitude? In solitude, I purposefully abstain from interaction with other human beings, denying ourselves companionship and all that comes from interactions with others. Because, listen, what we'll find, solitude is not about rest. That's what the Sabbath is about. Solitude is not about rest. Solitude is about dwelling upon my life in isolation between me and God. Solitude is about thinking about me in light of God. What is just me and just God? If you were to reduce all of your life down to what is there that's really between you and God, what is it? And that's what solitude helps me ponder. And that's one of the reasons why solitude is also so scary. But the, here's a the marvelous thing. Solitude can free us, actually. It frees us from, because oftentimes with people and in relationships, we get into ingrained behaviors. We get into habits of desire and our interaction with people. And what we do is we take a break from that and get alone with God. We can actually free ourselves from these other entanglements that we have with other relationships and souls and return back to these relationships as a, as a true self under God. It frees us. Look, we, we often talk a great deal about being individuals, but when you look at our conformity to social patterns, it's not really remarkable, is it? Right? Buy this cologne that will make you unique, like the other 1.9 million people that bought it. And then we buy it and think we're unique. In other words, what solitude does is helps us find ourselves again. Because look, if you're going to have this, if you're if you're gonna have a life that's marked by following Jesus that's marked by self-donating love, you have to have a self to give. 
And sometimes our lives get so enmeshed in other people's relationships, we get, get, our souls get entangled, so to speak, that we almost need to break out of that and practice solitude for a while, for some time, to a certain degree, so that we can return back and help love others. And that's why solitude, again, carries a risk, because it confront, we confront our own soul with its obscure forces and conflicts that often escape our attention in the busyness of the day-to-day -day life. And that's why Dallas Willard writes, this is what he says, solitude serves to crack open and burst apart the shell of our superficial securities. It opens us to the unknown abyss that we all carry deep within us and discloses the fact that these abysses are haunted. But there we must learn to cling to Jesus. Listen, we all have parts of our souls that we ignore. And oftentimes they are haunted. But listen, having a soul that's haunted... Uh, and, and just ignoring it doesn't do you any good. What would happen if we began to meet Jesus there? So to practice solitude, it will be painful and often threaten some of the most closest relationships in our lives. And that's why others who often need our help to keep their lives in place, it's a good thing when we practice solitude, because guess what? When we practice solitude, they have to learn to trust Jesus on their own and not have their lives completely rely upon me. So, the person that we love, they need, more, uh, they need God more than they need me, right? Or us. So what we must do is, even though they may not understand, we must carefully respect their pain and with much loving prayer and wise arrangements, help them understand what we're doing when we go to practice time in solitude with God so that we can return and be saturated in his love. In a world of constant communication with others, solitude, this going to the secret place, becomes more necessary than ever if we're going to live a life of listening to God and obeying. This is what Henry David Thoreau wrote once. As our inward quiet life fails, we go more constantly and desperately to the post office. Imagine if he knew about Twitter and email. As our inner life fails, we go more to the post office. We go more to avenues of communication. As our, inner word, as our inward life fails, we go more to the post office. But the poor fellow who walks away with the greatest number of letters, proud of his extensive correspondence, has not heard from himself in a long while. You know, the Bible refers to your soul in the third person. Right? Why are you downcast on my soul? He's talking to himself. <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord, O oh my soul. We will bless the Lord today, O oh my soul. Right? It treats the soul like a third person because oftentimes, for you to really discover what's in your soul, you almost have to give it space to emerge. You can't just go and decide you know what's going on inside of you. Anybody ever say, hey, how are you feeling about this? And you're like, I don't know how I feel. <laughs> That's oftentimes, I have to take moments of being alone with God to help even figure out what it is I feel, what's even going on in my soul. And then my soul can emerge, and I can begin to find that. And then I can take what I find in my soul and bring it into my relationship with God. So how do you practice solitude? Uh, one of the things I, I learned years ago is I like to schedule some time to practice. So, listen, we all have solitude, solitude like maybe a, we all know we should have a quiet time. We should read a Bible, turn the page, right? But if you want, maybe put it this way. That's great. That's, that's solitude. If you do that alone, you journal, you read, that's great. But my point is, oftentimes, um, we need more extended times of solitude because it's like trying to take a shower with one drop of water at a time. Sometimes we just need to just submerge ourselves in solitude with God. But we do it, I, I just joke with people and say, practice solitude long enough until you're no longer worried about the things you could be doing. Go into solitude with Jesus until you're no longer worried about all the stuff you could be doing. One of the things that solitude requires us, like Sabbath requires us to do, is to learn to trust God with the outcomes of our life. I can take time to rest because he can make sure the world it works out for my good. I don't have to always be in control of it. I can take time away with him because I trust him when I'm away. What do you do in solitude? We'll look in a moment. We'll engage in other practices like meditation on the word or prayer. But the point is that we take some time away that our soul might emerge. So that's solitude. You see it often, I encourage you to look up maybe how to do it in, in different ways. The second one would be fasting. Jesus practiced 
fasting, and he often expected his others, like in Matthew 6, when he says, when you fast, not if you fast, right? When you fast, he tells us. So a good definition of fasting, when I abstain in some significant way from food, possibly drink, obviously there can be other things you decide you're going to fast from, but at the core of it, what fasting teaches us to do is fasting teaches us that we do not have to fulfill all of our desires to learn to be content. Now, I don't know about you, but anytime I fasted, everybody like has some great word from God. First like week of fasting, all I find out is a bunch of bad stuff about myself. I find out how much of my body, how much of my peace was really tied to what I ate. I thought I was at peace, I was just full. <laughs> Turns out, you can't feel anxiety and pepperoni at the same time. So come on, pepperoni. We begin to discover how crafty and sneaky our body is at trying to get what it wants. I'm going to bring my body into subjection. I'm going to fast so that I can know God better. But man, that cookie looks good. One little cookie won't hurt. Or uh, what about a just solid chocolate milkshake? That, that's not eating. That's still drinking. But we begin to find out how the body just loves to trick ourselves, even against our best intentions. And that's what fasting teaches us, is that our, our belly does not have to be our God, as Paul says. Another thing that fasting teaches us is it teaches us how to depend on God and find source and, and, and even sustenance beyond food. Jesus said, I have food that you know not of, and that's to do the will of God. And we begin to discover as we fast that there's something that can... Uh, a steady, quiet contentment arises in our own soul. And we begin to realize, I do not have to get what I want, and somehow I can still be content and happy. And that's a very powerful thing to learn regarding any kind of spiritual growth. We do not have to get our way in order to actually to be settled, content, and happy in Jesus. So, this is one of the reasons why when Jesus teaches us to fast in Matthew, and he says, uh, you know, to, to don't look all sad, you, you know, to kind of freshen yourself up. He's not saying mislead people. He's saying that's actually how you'll begin to feel. As you begin to fast, what you'll begin to learn is that you can feast on God, and there'll be a refreshing that comes, even though your body doesn't seem to have the nourishment it might need. There's a nourishing of the soul that begins to happen. And fasting is a way that we learn self-denial. It's also a way that we learn how to suffer happily. Let me read you a great quote by Thomas Akempis. He's an old dead guy, but uh, great. This is what he said. He who knows how to suffer well will keep the most peace. That man is a conqueror of himself, Lord of the world, and a friend of Christ, and an heir of heaven. Learn to suffer well. Listen, I, I meet people that are like, you know, if I ever had to decide to give my life for Jesus, I could give my life for Jesus. And I just want to say, look, dude, you can't even deny yourself a taco. Let's be frank. You're not going to get burned at the stake, but we can't say no to drink. Everybody got, they got real quiet fast, didn't it? <laughs> My point is, we, we have to learn to suffer well because, listen, we are in a fallen world. And listen, it doesn't matter how spiritual you become, you will never escape suffering in this life. So we might as well learn now, under, not in moments of crisis, when there's a crisis happening, but when I am in the routine of my life learning how to suffer well with Jesus. Because there'll be a day when I don't have a choice about it and it comes. And how will I handle myself then? How do you do it? John Wesley, for example, fasted every Wednesday. You can fast uh, for periods of time. You can, you can um, mix it up and fast for lunch or fast for dinner. It's, again, going to be working with another practice of engagement, as we'll look at in a minute. It's important that you keep in mind your own health limitations. And you, listen, never attempt to do any of these practices that I'm telling you. Never attempt to practice these things and like, uh, be a hero. There are no heroes in, in, in the spiritual life. The more, you, the more you grow up in the Lord, the more you realize that it was only by his grace that you are where you are, and there's no boasting in it. So listen, somebody goes, I want to go deeper, and he said fasting. I'm fasting for 40 days. Look, let's just start with one. Just start with one. Let's do that. No heroes here. And just work, because listen, it's important that these practices become conducive to real life. Conducive to real life. So keep those things in mind. Jesus fasted for 40 days, and then you remember Satan came to tempt him, and I hear people say all the time, you see there, Satan came when he's, he's his weakest, when he's the most hungry, and tempted him with bread. And I just want to say, fasting did not make Jesus weaker, it made him stronger. You went 40 days without food, what's one more day when Satan shows up with bread? He's not the weakest moments, he's the strongest. 
because he's brought his body into subjection. So it trains us in contentment, and we can learn to experience quiet contentment in the Lord as we fast. All right, those are two of abstinence. So you have uh, solitude and fasting. Let me give you a couple practices of engagement that often go with these. They're, they're almost like breathing in and breathing out, right? Um, not, we, we don't learn, we don't really grow from negating. We don't really learn from stopping something. We actually learn from action by doing something. Does that make sense? So when you think of to yourself, I need to stop blank, I need to stop blank, that's never gonna help you. That's like saying, I'm not gonna look at the booger in the nose. I'm not gonna look at the booger in the nose. What do you do? You look at the booger in the nose because you're not giving your brain something else to do. All it hears is don't look at booger. But all it sees is booger. So same thing here, saying I'm just not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, is not really where growth comes from. Growth comes from saying I'm not going to do that because I'm going to be doing this. That's where growth begins to happen. That's why the Bible, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom. Not just repent from, not repent from these things, repent unto this. Here's the kingdom of God. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Something has now become available that previously was not available, so you should change the way you think, for it is here. Not just from something, but unto something. So what are these practices of engagement that can help us? Think of it maybe like blood cells that are designed to carry oxygen to your body. If they're filled with carbon dioxide, you die, right? In the same way, if the places in your soul that were meant to be indwelled by God are instead indwelt by disordered desires like food or sex or fame or fortune, you will die or at least languish for God. So practices of abstinence help kind of free our souls from the things that have filled them. And practices of engagement help us fill our souls with the things that we need to fill them with. So here are some um, practices. The first one is study or meditation of God's word. Jesus practiced it. He meditated. He memorized the scriptures. We know this. But what's important is we engage with the written and spoken word of God. We study it. It often goes... uh, Did I? I thought I just left my body for a second. We're all good? (laughs) Did you hear something funny or is that just me? Okay, I just want you to know, you, being a sound dude is like the most unthankful job in the world. You don't notice them until something goes wrong, and usually when it goes wrong, it had nothing to do with them but on somebody else. So, thank you, sound guys. We appreciate you. And whatever I did, <laughs> forgive me. We want to engage with the Word of God, but listen, we're not just engaging with it um, to simply engage with it. We're, tr- we're training ourselves to fill our mind with God and to learn to think the way the Bible teaches us to think. Listen, I'm telling you, Christians have to learn again how to think critically, to think deductively, and to do so in light of what God has revealed in Jesus Christ. Reason alone will not save us. Reason alone won't necessarily transform us. But we need it as part of, because we're not just um, a body with feelings, we're also a brain. We need both. We need thoughtful reflection on the scriptures. Now, when the Bible used to talk about maybe early days, like uh, church fathers that were people that wanted to follow the Spirit, people that wanted to just obey the Holy Spirit, we might call them charismatics, you might call them crazy, I guess, but uh, most people today call them charismatics, right? We want to follow Jesus, we want to be led by the Spirit. Well, the old word for that used to be mystic. You were a mystic if that's the way you wanted to live. Now, I just want you to hear, again, another quote from Dallas Willard about that. People who just want to be led by the Spirit called mystics, and this is what he said. Mystics? Uh, Being a mystic without study is only a spiritual romantic who wants relationship without effort. In other words, we must engage with and read God's word, even if we don't understand it. That's okay. Show up. Be there. Ask God to engage you there, and it will be helpful. It will not hurt you in the long run. But we're not only trying to know about God's character, we're trying to know God's work, and we're kind of trying to see it in the lives of people around us. We want to meditate on it prayerfully, not scholarly. I'm not saying you've got to have a degree in theology. I'm saying we take God's word, we read it, we pray into it, we ask questions of God in prayer, we sit there with him, but we're learning how to think about the world and life and myself in light of what God has revealed. And this is why for many times in the New Testament, the same effects for knowing the word of God are the same effects that come by being encountered by the Holy Spirit. Because for the word of God to really get into us, the spirit will have to be there to do it. So they go hand in hand. So we want to learn the word of God. We want to think with the mind of Christ. That's one. So study. The second one is worship. 
bringing God before the mind in meditation leads to worship. This is where we engage with and we dwell upon and express the greatness, the beauty of God and the goodness of God through all kinds of things, through thought, through music, but also through words, through symbols, through rituals and practices together as God's people. We, as we study and fill our mind with who God is, his beauty and his goodness, we turn to our worship. And, and worship is really about finding God worthy. It, uh, worship is really about where we ship our worth. It, not necessarily about music. It can be done with music. But here's what I want you to get. It needs to be done alone as much as it's done with other people. Learning to be alone and, and turn my mind to think upon God's greatness, his goodness and beauty, and just thank him. Just being grateful for what he has done. And as we worship God in this manner, paying a careful attention to uh, God's action and character, his worthiness, his goodness, we, our faith is increased and the word of God begins to come farther and deeper into our hearts. And oftentimes when we worship God, we are met by God himself. Where we go from just the musing of the mind upon God to where God all of a sudden is present before us. And we experience him as there. And that's powerful and beautiful. But listen, divine encounter is not what makes worship, is not why we worship. We worship because God is worthy. Divine encounter is God's deal. So we worship regardless if there's encounter. Because the goal is that God is worthy. And then he chooses to meet us as he sees fit. Practically for Christians, it seems more profitable to focus on the worship of God revealed in the person Jesus Christ. His death, his resurrection, the forgiveness, mercy, grace, the good news offered to him helps us and trains the way we think. Everybody all right about that? I'm trying to go a little, a little quick. but So I'm telling you, if you'll practice this, you'll, be, you'll see it. It does not always have to involve music. I'm telling you, it, it, for example, just pause in prayer and let your heart turn to awe and wonder. And watch the words that come out when you, when you can see God is beautiful. That's worship. Or when someone just simply sits quietly, no words at all, but the, the, the depths of their heart and their affection has been turned towards God. And their mind is musing on all he's done for them. That's worship. So study and worship are engagements, things we can do in solitude or while we're fasting. That's always helpful. But and listen, study, it, it's hard to love something if your mind is not thinking upon it. And that's what study and worship does. It's help fill our minds and hearts with God so that we might love him well. The next one I need to just move quickly is celebration. I wanted to pick this one out on purpose because uh, we're not that good at it. But I think we should. Celebration. Worship leads to celebration. And quite honestly, throughout the, at least in the Hebrew scriptures, celebration is actually the completion of worship. So let me help give you some definition. Uh, we worship God for who he is and for his actions in human history. But in celebration, we dwell upon God's goodness shown in me and to me. Worship, I worship God for who he is and what he's done throughout human. I can worship God for the fact he delivered Israel from uh, Egypt. I can worship God for Jesus has been raised from the dead. I can worship God because the sun rose this morning. But celebration is when I say, God, you were good to me, and here is where it was. It connects God's activity with my real life. And I'm telling you, one of the most powerful things we can do, listen to me, community group leaders, one of the most powerful things you can do is gather people together and enjoy good things like a meal, uh, uh, enjoy and tell stories of God's faithfulness to us. That's celebration. And it seems a bit hedonistic for some. I, I want to read you a passage. Um, those back there on the scriptures, you do not have this one, so don't freak out. Um, I, I'm just going to quote it. But I just want you to hear this. This is Deuteronomy 14. This is if somebody had a gift and they were to travel a long ways to make a sacrifice. And during that travel, their gift, what they were bringing, may spoil, may go bad. This is what God commands them to do. Just listen. And if, on the, way is too, or if the way is too long for you, that you are not able to carry the tithe, then the Lord your God blesses you because the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God has chosen to set his name here. Then you shall turn. Listen to this. You shall turn it into money. And bind up the money in your hand and go to the place that the Lord of God has chosen and spend the money for whatever you desire. Oxen or sheep or wine and strong drink. Glory to God, right? Whatever your appetites craves. Listen. And you shall eat before the Lord and you shall rejoice in your God and he shall be pleased. How hedonistic is that? God says, I want, this is what I want you to do. Take that money and 
take your whatever, calf, whatever, turn into money, take that money, go to, my place, go to the place I tell you to, and I want you to enjoy me there. We celebrate when we enjoy, a very, it's a very, very earthly characteristic. We enjoy the good things that God has made. We enjoy a, a good steak. We, I better be careful at 1135 talking about food. But we enjoy, and listen, I know it seems really sensual, and, and like it has this earthly character to it. And, but, but here's the deal. It is an antidote to despair and to materialism. We live in a world that's not as it should be. And things happen that are gut-wrenchingly hard. And celebration simply reminds us that in the middle of all this, God has been good to us, and this is not the end. Yeah. If it's not good, then it's not over. Yeah. And that's what celebration does. Celebration also fights off materialism. One of the greatest antidotes against materialism is the enjoyment of legitimate pleasure unto God. Amen. Enjoying the good things that he made. And that called, listen, that's, I don't want to get off on this, but this is just extra that's where tithing comes in. Tithing, we say, is worship. It's really about celebration. Tithing is about bringing what God has provided. God's not asked me to give more than he's provided. He's asked me to give out of what he's provided. And I bring a tithe in recognition. God, I see your faithfulness. You have provided. And I tithe going, now I trust and expect you. You'll provide again in the future. I'm going to celebrate the fact that now you have provided. So I don't tithe because I know what's coming. I tithe because what has been provided. And we celebrate it. It's a celebration of God's goodness. Recently, we had a couple uh, send Pastor Lawrence to tech that they're beginning to, they're starting to tithe for the first time. And seeing the joy and delight in them is contagious. But that's true celebration. It's to be joyful. All right. The last one, and I, I need to come quickly, is uh, contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer is different than pray, praying of, for intercession or praying that somebody might be healed or praying prayers of thanksgiving. Contemplative prayer is when we converse with God about matters of our soul. When we have conversations with God about our soul. Contemplative prayer always has an element of self-awareness and soul-searching with God. It is inviting God into the deep places of our souls to commune with us there inviting God to converse with us about places that are often even hidden from us and asking him to love us there that he might heal us. Look, it, it changed my life when I realized one day that my prayer often languishes because I stopped praying about what really matters to me. And I started praying what I thought God wanted to hear from me. You want to run a good prayer life, do that. Prayer is about conversing with God about things of mutual concern. What concerns him and what concerns me. And when you stop praying about those things, you, stop, you start to stop praying. But not only that, when you stop pausing after you pray to listen for God's response, you'll stop praying. If we don't simply just, it's not just asking, but also or talking about the things in our soul, it's also waiting to see what God has to say about those things in our souls. That's where it becomes powerful. Conversing with God cannot fail to have a pervasive, uh, strengthening effect on all aspects of our life and personality. And it becomes almost like a magnet that pulls the compass true north. And we begin to pray about, um, uh, we begin to, begin to pray without ceasing. Because look, once you learn that you can pray to God about the darkest places of your soul, you begin to realize you can pray with him, talk with him about anything, so you begin to talk with him about everything. And you begin to pray without ceasing, not because you're trying to learn how to pray without ceasing. It's because you couldn't wait to talk to him about it. That you're inviting him and invoking his presence on daily things, things I do routinely throughout my day. I'm bringing God into it in prayer. So, for example, anybody ever had one of those days where you say, oh, man, I really need to quit that. I really need to quit that, right? Maybe. Not you. Okay, just me. Well, contemplative prayer, contemplative prayer teaches us to ask a different question. Or make a different statement. Instead of, I really need to quit that, contemplative prayer says, Lord, where are you in this behavior that I keep repeating and desire to quit? Or Lord, is there anything that you want to say to me about this that might heal me or bring revelation to me? Or Lord, what is going on in my soul when I do blank, blank, or blank? Will you meet me? Will you come be for me what I can't be for myself? It's where we ask God's opinion. We're honest. We're, 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 we're bring, listen, whatever the elephant is in the room, we're okay to talk with it about God. 
We're able to say things like, God, I really love you and I think you're Lord, but I'm not really interested in you being Lord of my finances yet because I'm afraid you're going to make me poor. That's a conversation to have with God, and he wants to have that with you. Or God, I'm afraid to bring you into my my sexual life because I'm afraid you're going to make it all prudish and boring. That's We can pray with God about that. Or God, I'm afraid to bring you into my job because you're going to make me be all spiritual and weird. I can pray with him about that. Or Lord, I'm afraid to really ask you to be Lord of my children because I'm afraid you're going to ship them to Africa. You're going to make them missionaries. Listen, what I'm trying to say is God wants to talk to you over the dark places of your soul. And you'll find him to be the lover of your soul when you're willing to bring those things in your soul and have a conversation with him about it. We ignore those things. If we ignore bringing those things to God, it says more about what we believe to be true about God than it says what we believe to be true about us. Do we believe God is good and merciful? Do I believe he will be kind to me and compassionate? Do I believe he has something to say about these things that will heal me and make me more human and more alive as God intended, not less? Then I can bring those things to him and have a conversation about him. Contemplative prayer brings the deepest and hidden parts of our souls to God so he can change us. It's scary, but we learn to pray this way by learning to pause, to figure out what's going on inside of us, to begin to talk to God about it. A few years ago, I remember, not year, about a little over a year ago, I remember sitting down to have a quiet time and just didn't want to be there. I know that sounds really unspiritual, but that's the case. And that actually was not just the first day. <laughs> like That happened quite a bit. So I finally learned to just say, Lord, I don't want to be here but I'm going to show up anyway. And I'm asking you to come meet me here. And I need you to do something about my desires because I don't desire you right now. But I desire to desire you. So I need you to do something in my desiring. Here I am. God is not offended by that. He will welcome that invitation. And that's what I'm talking about with the contemplative prayer. What are the things you're ignoring talking to God about and Why? It's been my experience, those are normally the exact things he wants to talk about, and that's infuriating, isn't it? He doesn't want to talk about other things, he wants to talk about this. Anyway, all right, in conclusion, uh, I have one of those. Worship team, would you mind coming up? I'm going to try to land this plane. Here's the question. Are these practices enough to take us deeper? Fasting, I mean solitude and fasting, study, worship, celebration, contemplative prayer. Are they enough? Now look, I've only given you six uh, historically practiced things in the church. But there's more. Uh, Silence, frugality, secrecy, sacrifice, service, fellowship, confession. You can read them all if you want to. Those are all practices the church has practiced. But this is what I want you to understand. Trying to ask the question, will these practices change me, is the wrong question. Because these practices will not change you. These practices become places you go to meet the one who will change you. These practices make space to meet God. They don't make me holy. They don't make me righteous. They make me available. I go to fasting because I want to meet Jesus. I go into contemplative prayer because I need God. I go into study because I don't think well about him and I want to think better about him. I go into worship because though I see enough of his beauty, I want to see more of it. Or I've seen some of his beauty, I want to see more of it. Do you see? They're not acts of righteousness, they're acts of wisdom. These practices do not change us. I know what you're thinking, and why in the world do you spend all this time on them? <laughs> because they become places we go where God will pour out his grace and we can receive it better and we can be transformed by his grace there. So in the end, here's the deal. If we really want to go deeper, then we have to search for the right means in order to go deeper, the practices that will help us get there. I've given you some that are historically proven, that were practiced by Jesus Christ, and uh, are accessible to us all to do. Now here's the real question. Do you really want to go deeper? I've given you six things you can do tomorrow. I don't recommend doing all of them in one time. Right, don't be a hero. But six things you could practice routinely to, to see God transform you. So the real question is, do you desire to go deeper with God? And here's the great news. Even if you don't, that's something God wants to talk to you about. He wants to say, hey, let's talk about why you don't want to go deeper. And he wants us to be honest with him there. Oftentimes, we don't want to go deeper with God because of a particular vision we have of what he'll make us be. And we don't even know if that, that vision's accurate. I remember one time telling my dad, I don't want to be a really good Christian, I just kind of want to be a C Christian. 
because I, I don't want to go, I don't want to be a missionary. <laughs> like, I was afraid God going to send me somewhere, right? Then he's good, and he can be trusted. So we have to have a vision of Christ. Maybe you don't want to be, to go deeper. Maybe the prayer could be something like this. God, I feel like if I go deeper, you will blank. What is it? You'll make me whatever, or you'll ask me whatever. Then the follow-up would be, but would you come and speak to me here? Because I'm open for you to transform me. Oftentimes we're afraid that God will make us desire things or lose, give up desires that we have. What we might find is our desires change. And when we have those desires, they're still as deeply satisfying as the other ones. They're just more legitimate and ordered. So, we want to practice these things, but we don't want to be a hero. Pick some that stand out to you. Maybe schedule time. Make it conducive to real life. Make them consistent. You show up, God will do the heavy lifting. We discover as we meet God in the spiritual practices that his yoke really is easy and his burden really is light. And it's only heavy because I make it heavy and clunky. We find he wants to be for us far more than he wants us to be something for ourselves. So, it's not about doing them once, but regularly. It's not about getting the practices right or correct. It's about going to them to meet Jesus. So your GP2RL, that stands for God's presence to real life. Here's the practice I just want to encourage you with or leave you with today. Would you take time this week? I think it's coming on. Oh, maybe not. Okay, your GP2RL, there it is. Is take time to reflect on your rhythms and practices that will help you go deeper this next year. Yeah, I just need to, need to end. So here, in Mark chapter 4, verse 26, would you stand? Why don't you do that first? In Mark chapter 4, verse 26, Jesus tells a parable. And he says, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who planted a seed. Day and night, he goes in and out. Then one day, the seed springs up to life. And he doesn't know when, and he doesn't know how. I found in my personal life, and and it's not very much. I wish I I was farther along than I am. So look, this is not bragging as much as uh, something that I found to be true that most people experience. We go to these places to meet Jesus, and we're kind of like, where's the big deal? Why is he not, like, you know, knocking me out, or I'm shaking, or why is he not some powerful, transformative experience? And oftentimes what happens in these practices is like a seed getting planted. But all of a sudden, you begin to notice that you're changing. And you, can, you don't know when, and you don't know how. You just know that the Lord has changed you. That's usually how it goes. So I just encourage you to keep showing up and let God plant those seeds. And when they bloom, don't try to figure it out. Rejoice with exceedingly great joy, for he's been faithful to us. So I'm going to ask the prayer team if you'd step to the back. We're going to just respond in worship. There's a couple of ways. One is, again, we have baptism coming up in a couple of weeks. If that's something you would like, again, you have the uh, card in the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out, put it in the giving station, and we'll get in touch with you about baptism. Maybe you know somebody else who wants to be baptized, parents especially. Children aren't hearing this announcement, so if that's something that you'd want, we need to know. The second thing is um, there's communion in the back as we worship. You can go take communion. It's also a great time if you'd like. There's giving stations in the back for your tithes and offerings. But we just want to worship and respond as we feel led. And I hope this has been practically helpful in how we might go deeper this next year. Father, we don't want to just talk about going deeper. We want to go deeper. And we're clumsy and um, awkward. But so is anyone learning something new. And we want to learn to obey. So would you teach us? Would you help us arrange our lives in such a way like you did that we might just show up and find grace? We might learn how to stay at home with you no matter what might come our way. And Lord, now we just turn and we want to take a moment to worship, to just say we're so thankful. 
that our transformation is not dependent upon us because that would be fragile. We thank you that you who began a good work in us will bring it to completion. And so we worship you and we thank you that you're the kind of God who wants to meet with us and do the heavy lifting yourself. We say thank you, Holy Spirit. Now help us to worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.